Happy, uh, happy Friday, you guys. Happy uh, end of the week. We've made it at last. We made it through our, our big time epic, if you want to call it that, snowstorm. Um, I know some, uh, you know, we told you out to the west. It was going to be troublesome getting the snow uh, out to the west. So I know snowbirds out there and snow lovers out that way were a little disappointed. Um, again, it was, it's tough to do. Tough to get that snow back that far west. Storm was a little far away from us. But those who live east, uh, sort of got as expected. Two inches out through Prince George's County, down through southern Maryland. And once you got to the tip of St. Mary's County, which would have been the jackpot on the eastern side of the bay. They had five, in some cases, six inches of snow. We'll go through snow to totals in a sec. We'll go through temperatures first, though, because uh, that's the big story of the day before. Uh, uh, that's the big story of the day today. Actually, you know what? Let's, let's do snow first. Let's go through past first, and then we'll get to current, and then uh, talk about the future. Um, good news. Sort of things quieting down a little bit on the weather pattern, and we just got to get rid of the cold. Um, let me take you to the place that got the most snow or at least one of the highest totals that I've seen. Oh, how about Ocean City, Maryland, waking up to 11 inches of fresh snowfall this year. That's a live picture from the uh, boardwalk cam. Um, again, good good snow for the beaches. I mean, so often those areas to the east of us, when we have these big, strong, powerful storms that come up, they get missed with the big-time snows, and, and they get the rain, and we get the big snow. Not this time, opposite. Ocean City got the big snow, 11 inches there, um, and some locations uh, around that area got – just slightly more or slightly less. Salisbury, Maryland, I know got 10 inches. Big story locally is the cold. These are temperatures outside right now. 17 in Washington, 19 in Manassas, 16 in Dulles, Gaithersburg's at 13, Baltimore's at 14. If you watch this later on YouTube, it's 11:20 in the morning. So uh, these are temperatures again uh, outside at this moment. But you factor in a little bit of wind because that is all it takes, and you get some brutally cold wind chills. Right now it feels like negative one degrees here in Washington, D.C. Let me move the banner. Even down as far south as Raleigh, it feels like 14. Hatteras on the coastline, which is typically uh, the ocean helps keep things warm. Winds are blowing strongly off out of the north and west, so that's forcing the cold all the way down to the south there. So it feels like 11 there. Look at Pittsburgh. How about that? Negative 18 degrees there, negative 13 for Detroit. Binghamton, New York, where they've had wind chills in the negative 30s and 40s at times up in that upstate New York area this morning. Uh, they're feeling like negative 24 degrees here, and uh, we're approaching the lunchtime hour, 11.20 in the afternoon. So, again, cold is sticking around. Don't think it's going anywhere here too fast. Um, and, uh, it's, it's again, it's thanks to that storm that we had yesterday. Let's, uh, let's push over, and we'll do those snowfall totals I promised you. Here's what it looks like in terms of what the National Weather Service was able to find uh, for neighborhoods around D.C. Let's roll through a couple of these. Um, let me zoom in here on the map so everybody can kind of figure out where it is. Again, this is from weather.gov. This is your local uh, weather service here. Immediate me D.C. metro area, they had a, a trace to half an inch around the Silver Spring area. Locally, downtown, about a half an inch of snow. At the airport, they got just under an inch. And then in Alexandria, where I was stationed yesterday, they had about an inch of snow, according to their, uh, maybe down towards Franconia there, they're saying an inch and a half of uh, snowfall down around there. You push east, that's where your, your bigger totals were. Annapolis, two inches of snow. Trevena Park, two inches of snow. Uh, down through Prince George's County, they had three inches. In uh, Hughesville, Crane's father reported 3.8 inches, actually, there in Hughesville. But not too far away, 2.2 inches there in, uh, in Southern Point, Central Prince George. Just outside of Waldorf, looked like 2.5 inches. There's your bigger zone down St. Mary's County. Those purples, anything in purple there is four inches or above. That's five inches down towards Great Mill, and in the very tippy, tippy point, St. Mary's County down there, um, right around Ridge, they picked up five and a half inches of snow. Now, your bigger totals were on the coast. This is down the Wakefield, the Wakefield office. There's your snowfall. Um, let's get out towards Ocean City. There it is, 11 inches of snow right there. You can kind of see we sort of have to interpret this. Uh, 11 inches of snow right there, just on the interior, almost nine inches of snow. You had a little bit farther south. Six inches of snow towards Salisbury. I know they had, okay, they had 11 and a half inches, according to some of the news stations out in Salisbury, Maryland. So good. That was your jackpot zone, eastern shore, right where we thought it would be. It's nice to be right every now and then, because I know we have to be not right all the time, so it's good to be right this time. 
down uh, towards the Virginia Beach area, they had good snow. So. But, you know, a lot of uh, differentiation depending on what side of the city you are. Near the coastline, I believe I only saw like 3 inches, 3.2 inches there at North Bay, right near the North Bay. But you have inland, you get 11 and a half inches of snow near uh, Grand Bridge there. So generally speaking, I believe I read reports that people down south around Virginia Beach are waking up to about a foot of snow. You head into the interior towards the Richmond area, two and a half inches of snow, not a bad snowfall for them, two and a half to two inches around the Richmond. All right, so what's up with the cold or what's coming next? What do we have to worry about in the weather world? Uh, again, this weekend is fine in the weather department in terms of will there be any rain, snow, sleet, ice, anything. No, we're fine. You, you can get outside and enjoy it in that regard, but you'll probably want to stay inside anyway uh, because these really cold temperatures aren't really going anywhere until late. Honestly, during the overnight hours of Sunday into Monday is when the cold's finally going to start to lift away. This is, I'm, I'm rewinding the clock a little bit. Right there, uh, that area low pressure you see off the coastline, of course, we're right here in D.C. where I just drew that dot. Uh, watch as that area low pressure goes up. That's your storm from yesterday. It goes up. The cold spills in behind it. And look how the cold just kind of sticks around. I'm now getting out into Sunday morning. You see the purples. You see the pinks. That's the brutal cold here in D.C. How cold will we be? Here's some of the latest models from Pivotal Weather. Let me slide this down so we make sure we're getting a logo because I don't want to steal anybody's stuff. Uh, PivotalWeather.com with these maps. This is from the North American model. They have 14 degrees. If you're heading out later on this evening, 14 degree air temperature at about 8 o'clock tonight, 11 for Frederick, 10 north and west, down to the south towards uh, St. Mary's County. They have temperatures in the upper teens. But as I mentioned before, with the wind, it's never really going to feel like it. Let's do some wind chills. According to the model, wind chill at that time will feel like negative 1, 8 o'clock tonight in D.C., negative 5 up towards Frederick, negative 7 farther north and west. Garrett County, Maryland, you're under a wind chill warning for a reason. Uh, wind chills are tonight, you know, negative 15 degrees, uh, I, I guess, plus, but really minus. Uh, so wind chills below negative 15 possible as you head up towards the Garrett County, Maryland kind of area in the, the mountains. Just because the mountains get the stronger winds when you have storms like this, they're higher elevated. Uh, that's what they have to contend with. People out there know what's up. They live out there uh, for a reason. Um, they, they're able to handle but, you know, stay safe, take it seriously, because uh, wind chills like this can, um, can really actually kind of do some damage to your skin if you leave it unprotected. So you're going outside today, put the gloves on, put the scarf on, wrap it around a couple times, maybe throw an extra coat of your already heavy coat just to keep yourself warm. Here's tomorrow, uh, that's 9Z. Let's go out one more time to get you out to 7 o'clock or uh, 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. It's actually 7 this time of year. Um, Feeling like negative 8, negative 9, negative 10 degrees. Uh, feeling like negative 11 up towards Frederick, negative 13 north and west of there. They have widespread sub-zero wind chills once again tomorrow morning. So if you have outdoor plans, again, for your Saturday morning, things do get a little better in the afternoon. But Saturday morning, brutally cold. Get, look, here's the afternoon hours by 3, 4 o'clock. Feeling like zero here in D.C. Feeling like negative 2 up in Frederick. Personally, I'll be sitting inside all weekend, or I'm going to try to. Uh, and just bundling up, and uh, I, I'm lucky enough I got a fireplace at my place, so I'm going to make a little fire and uh, stay inside and enjoy it. What's next in terms of what we have to worry about? I'll keep this video a little brief, and we'll get out of here uh, and start enjoying our weekend. Um, again, high pressure right there. There's your cold. You see all the colors. You see high pressures at 8. It's going to start to push off to our east, and unlike other high pressures over the past few weeks, we, we've had these dive bombing highs that kind of come down out of Canada, and they dive straight south. So we almost always stay on their eastern flank, which means the winds continue to kind of come out of the north. This time, this strong area of high pressure is going to dive kind of eastward, and it's going to get off the coast just east of here. And when it does that, it's going to pick up return flow, and we're going to start to warm things up. Watch the greens kind of overtake the blues as we head into that's Monday morning. Then as we get into Monday afternoon, you're going to start spilling in a little bit of warm air here at the other upper levels of the atmosphere. One thing we do have to be concerned about on Monday is when you start bringing in that south wind, especially at the, at the uh, upper levels of the atmosphere, cold air is stubborn to leave at the surface. Cold air is heavy. Um, it doesn't like to move as fast as our weather models like to say it moves. With that southern wind at the uh, ab above our heads in the upper levels of the atmosphere, you're going to get a little bit of moisture. Because look, if you trace, I know they're really hard to see, but there's black lines on there that are wind barbs. If you trace the wind barbs, they're coming right off the gulf and coming up into our area. And in a minute, if I go forward far enough, 
you'll see a weak little storm start to develop. There's a little spin in the atmosphere right here, so there's a little area of low pressure, and you're gonna get a warm front that kind of tries to extend north and cross into our region. Could have a little bit of moisture with it, and that means, given how cold we've been and given how cold we will be, if anything's able to squeeze out and fall from the sky, we could have some icing issues, some mixing issues here on Monday. The details on it are really sketchy. Will it be a big storm? Looking at the upper level stuff, again, I, that's, that's what I do. I do the nerdy stuff. Um, it, it doesn't look like it's going to be a big storm because you have two energy pieces, one way too far south here and one too far to the north. Unless this guy here digs a whole lot farther south, um, you, uh, you're not going to get that storm blowing up into much of anything. Instead, it's going to be a separate piece, weaker storm, but it will kick up enough moisture that will get a little bit of... Uh, of something falling from the sky. And the question is then, will it freeze on contact? What time will it be here? All those questions still have to be hammered out in time. But unless this digs far enough south to catch this, we're not gonna get any sort of big storm around here. So I'm not terribly worried about that. Uh, again, what I am a little bit more worried about is whether or not we get any sort of tricky moisture in here. And right now, models kinda wanna spit something out here. Uh, again, it's showing up here as rain, but with these freezing surface temperatures and these single digit and teen surface temperatures that we've had over the past few days and that we will have in the days to come, anything that falls could quickly turn to ice. So we do have to be concerned. Timing has kind of varied in the various models between Monday morning and Monday night. All those details will kind of have to be worked out. I'll put the latest stuff on social media as we get a little deeper. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm kind of ready for a little break, so I'll probably take today and the first half of tomorrow off. But as we get into Saturday night and Sunday, I'll start posting more and more stuff. Mike T. Fox 5 on Twitter, Mike Thomas Fox 5 on Facebook, and we'll get you updated on uh, any sort of concerns we have for Monday. Possibly morning commute, possibly evening commute, sometime in between, sometime after. We will uh, bring you the latest there. But just know we're watching Monday for possibly, I know Tucker mentioned it all morning on air, um, for something possibly happening. Beyond that, we will start to see a warming trend here. Things are going to start to flip around as we head into January. We're sick of the cold. We have breaks coming. In fact, I think we're going to lose uh, our storm chances here as we head into the second half of the month. But we're not in the second half of the month just yet. Again, we mentioned Monday. That's uh, We're at upper levels of the atmosphere. That's a big trough on the east. Uh, that's what's keeping the cold in. It fades away. We start to get what's called a ridge developing over the east. It's weak, uh, but it will warm us up throughout the day on Monday and into Tuesday. Then as we head into the middle part of the week, we'll, we'll briefly get a little cold, and then the second half of the week could get really warm. In fact, we went close to 50 on Thursday. Some of our models suggest that we could potentially be up near 60. I'll show you those in just a second. Um, it's behind that things get a little interesting. That area of high pressure is going to be a northern runner, and if that runs off to the north, watch this guy here. This is, again, this is the nerdy stuff I do. Watch this little ball of energy here in the, the, uh, off the Pacific coastline. Watch as it spins inland through the western half of the United States. It tries to come around, and I know the model loses it a little bit, because what you're going to see is you're going to build a ridge on the west coast. That's going to shoot up, grab some cold air, and throw it down south into our, well, down towards our general area. And you do have energy down here in the south. You're pushing the ridge a little farther east. you got a big high pressure out here in the Atlantic that would turn any storminess off to the north. And you could do a coastal runner right in between those ridges, right there. I know it, it's tough to see because we're so far out that the models are kind of um, uh, kind of giving you more of a general picture than what's, what's going on. But you got a decent right up here in the west, and I know I'm, I'm blocking it a little bit with my picture. Sorry about that. Uh, but right there you have a nice ridge in the west that's going to push cold air briefly down. Uh, you got a trough building in the east, and you have a big ridge off the coast. So any sort of storminess that happens would have the chance to run the coastline there. The question is just, are we going to get cold air in here fast enough in time to get any sort of storm over to the snow category as opposed to the rain category? We'll wait and see. If I switch real quick and go forward to the uh, mean sea level pressures around that same time, where you see red is high pressure, so you have a nice big high coming down into the plains. You have a high up here, kind of similar to what we just saw, honestly, uh, with, again, Arctic high out here, blocking high out here. Your weakness is in this general area, so that's kind of where you could potentially get storms. That's next weekend. That won't be a concern of mine or Tucker's until we get the middle of next week because these models like to change on us all the time when we talk extended range forecasting. I just want to show you kind of what we're rolling with. Beyond next weekend, we look for other climate signals, Madden-Julian oscillations, 
now I'm going to get super nerdy because it has to do with precipitation patterns over the Indian and the uh, Pacific Oceans. Don't worry about that. Just notice what this model is doing. We're currently, this orange line is what's currently happening. We've gone into what's called phase two, and all these lines swing around from phase two to uh, three to four to five. See how those lines kind of do this circle thing? So again, our starting point is kind of right here, and these lines generally swing down like this over the course of the next 15 days. What I mean by phase four and phase five, again, it's all about precipitation patterns, but that's important because here's what temperatures tend to do in the United States when we hit phase four and phase five. There's January phase four warming up here on the eastern coastline, and then watch what happens if we get into, uh, I gotta take something real quick. Watch what happens if we get into phase five. Look how super warm that is. That could come our way later in January. We could certainly be going through a warm up here in DC as we head towards uh, January. There's the models I was talking about that are getting us closer to uh, 60 degrees next week. European models tend to be good, uh, but that other red. So you have two European models. You got your operational and you got your ensembles. If you follow my page, although I, I post them both frequently. The ensembles are cooler than the operational, so that's why we haven't gone 60s yet here, but we could get there. We'll see what next week brings. That would be like next Thursday, Friday time frame for a little bit of a warm up. Um, the freezing line is that blue line that goes straight across like that, that I just covered with red. So look, we got above freezing temperatures at least coming our way. And you can see if I kind of trace the average temperatures. And by the way, these those l vertical lines show the diurnal range. So your upper end is your high, your lower end is your low. Um, again, if I kind of just trace the average temperatures through the day and go right through the middle, above kind of freezing next week, maybe back down to freezing next weekend time frame when we want to watch for maybe another storm around the East Coast. And then up we go, and we could continue to go up as we head into later kind of the January 18th and beyond time frame towards the end of the month. It does look like we got a pretty good warm up coming our way. The great January thaw is what other meteorologists are coming uh, are coming out and saying it's going to be as we head towards the second half of the month. So if you're sick of the cold here in D.C., I do think a break is coming. I think the second half of January is going to be a little milder than the first. That doesn't, it won't take much to do that. Um, but it does, if, if you're a climate guy and you watch the climate stuff, it does look like there's a decent chance for some cold. I don't, don't think it will be extreme as what we've seen. We won't know until we get there. But it does look like some cold tries to come back our way in February. And if you know anything about D.C. in February, it tends to be when we have our biggest snowfall. So we'll wait. We'll watch. We'll see what we get. Um, again, locally, it's a really cold weekend, but looks nice and sunny. And then as we head into uh, next week, we're watching Monday, then late week warm-up, and then uh, we'll watch next weekend for any sort of storminess if it, we happen to get one. All right, that's it. I'm done. I promise. Well, I, I hope I don't appear anymore this weekend. Um, uh, take care, guys. Have a safe and happy weekend. Enjoy your time off. Congratulations to all the kids around this region that got a four-day weekend with the snow yesterday and the cold this morning. We'll watch Monday. We'll see if things get tricky in the morning or evening or at all. Um, and we'll, we'll keep you ahead of any storms or anything that comes our way. Other than that, stay warm this weekend. I hope you, uh, you all have warm plans. And then uh, we'll see you back here on Monday. Looking forward to that. So I'm signing off here, guys.
All right, guys, we are back uh, for the news portion of Fox 5 Live. So welcome to our show back inside the newsroom here at Fox 5 DC. And you're right, Iran, it is DJ Molly. I was, you heard when I flipped that tune, right? Oh, yeah. I came over here and I was like, I'm going to edit this new thing. Iran knows now. He knows. He knows Molly. Yeah, yep. Uh, but hey, guys, happy Friday, January 5th. Super excited to be here. Lots of interesting news sort of headlines and topics uh, that we got going on today. And we're going to talk about them sort of throughout the show, throughout the inter, uh, inter, uh, afternoon, rather. And right now we have a couple feeds coming in that I don't want to miss, so I'm going to go right over there, uh, and then we'll sort of talk more about some of the hot topics that people are talking about today, vis-a-vis uh, -vis just stuff that's coming out, news. We have an interview later today, so stay tuned for it, at 1 o'clock Eastern time with the owner of a local bookstore that is very close to my heart, actually, um, close to this bookstore for a number of years, and the owner is going to talk about how they sold out of Fire and Fury, the new book by Michael Wolf that... Um, it hits or hits the sands early rather the the um the what you call it public publishers said that they were going to put it on early so that people could buy it it's the book that had some insider information about the trump administration including some of his top advisors and aides coming out with some choice words for president trump and people want to read that so president trump saying and uh, the president trump administration the white house saying that it's pretty phony, you know, makes people want to run to those bookstores. So we're going to talk to the owner of this local store and ask him what it was all about. Last night at midnight, they decided to sell it early. It sold out. People stood out in the frigid cold oh, for yeah. this book. Really interesting stuff. So kind of a testament, I guess, to the political times, sort of the nature of what's going on in D.C. And also um, we have, let's see, whatever else we have of feeds coming in from Massachusetts. They're still dealing with some snowy... Um, situation there and, and measures to keep people safe in that. But right now, before we miss it, live right now in Chicago, they're talking about flu season, which is prominent right now, and uh, how what they're doing to combat it. We're going to hear from some doctors and stuff in this live press conference in Chicago. So let's jump right over there, and then we'll come back in with some more stuff. More than just a simple cold. I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Maybe, Karen? Sure. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Uh, my name is Kelly Bemis, K E L L E Y B E M. IS. I'm the Enhanced Surveillance Program Manager in the Communicable Disease Unit at the Cook County Department of Public Health. I'm responsible for putting together our influenza surveillance data for suburban Cook County. So the numbers that you just cited come from a network of what we call Sentinel Laboratories. So laboratories from hospitals in our area who have agreed to voluntarily share their data with us. It's de-identified and shared with us on a weekly basis. So the total number that you just referred to, that's how many specimens were positive. If, you'd, if you're interested out in the denominator, the complete total, I can get that number for you, but it's 32%. I guess I'm confused because you're talking about 149. Is, is oh, the number of admissions. Sorry. Well, yeah, 1,500. So, I mean, 149 is from where? Yes. And then 1,500 is from where? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so that's, I was speaking about the system. Cook County Health and Hospital System. Mm -hmm. So the so the so the yeah. public health department gets positive tests for from wherever uh, they are obtained. There's a funneling from other health systems that test toward the public health department in the city. That would be toward the city's Department of Public Health. In the suburban Cook County, some 130 municipalities that would come to our Cook County Department of Public Health. But those are from all testing sites, including physicians' offices. The yes. Yes. For the for for suburban Cook County. For suburban Cook County. Yes, sir. So hospitals go on bypass for a variety. For, for a variety of reasons, either because the hospital itself might be full, the emergency room might be overwhelmed, or a particular service, for instance, a trauma service, might be overwhelmed temporarily. 
as Dr. Wellbell alluded to earlier, the uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Joshi alluded, alluded to earlier, any hospital system or particularly emergency department that's seeing an increase in the proportion of people who are coming in with an influenza-like illness, they can back up an emergency room. Now, our health system never goes on bypass because we're a critical part of the local and regional disaster responsiveness. But for other smaller hospitals, it can be overwhelming because, as you might understand, the testing both for influenza or for other things that might be causing a patient's influenza-like symptoms can take a period of time, and that's what might drive a place to put up their we're full sign. There's also, but they also said that that's why they're doing it, is they're adding these ambulances five more in order to accommodate all the flu cases that have come. So that's what you're referring to there? Well, I can't speak to what the, what the fire department uh, uh, said. I'm, I'm not privy to that. What I would point out is that the vast majority of people who come to any hospital's emergency room with an influenza-like illness, the majority of them come by public transportation or they get dropped off by family. Only a very seriously ill person or a person who might be socially isolated would necessarily be coming by the fire department. Just one more thing. They also called it a, a near pandemic. Well, there are technical terms that our public health experts can speak to as to the what gets called the, an epidemic, endemic, or pandemic. Those are very specific kinds of things. Certainly, there has not been a pandemic described for influenza yet for this year. Can we go back to the 1,500? I just want to make sure I've got that yeah. correct. 1,500 in the entire suburban county, is that right? Yeah. So this number is more of an... Sorry, I'm little. <laughs> uh, this number is really more of an estimate. Influenza cases are not required to be reported to the health department, and so we rely on voluntary reporting, and we get that from a network of laboratories. So this number represents, I'm sorry? Yes, it is likely more than that. So but it's accurate to say 1,500 in Cook County, correct? I would use probably the Chicago land area. Yeah, so it's early in the season to really know for sure how effective this year's vaccine is. We can say that from last year, against the predominant strain, which is H3N2, the vaccine was about 32% efficacious. We also know that we have the same component in the vaccine that we did last year. And so far, the viruses that have been tested are similar to what we saw last year. So it's feasible that the vaccine will still be about 32% efficacious, but we really don't know that. It's too early to tell. So why is it the best bet to get vaccinated? Yeah, given that efficacy. Yeah, so the, it's, well, one, it still can prevent one from getting vaccine, and that 32% only refers to the H3N2, which is the predominant strain that's circulating but there's also influenza B and there's another strain of influenza A. So it does work better on those strains. In addition to that, if one gets vaccinated, it's more likely that that person will have a milder case of the flu. They may be less likely to be hospitalized. They may even be less likely to die. And as I said earlier, we know from a study, at least one study, that children are statistically significantly less likely to die if they've been vaccinated. Yeah. Sure. It's Sharon Wellbell, W-E-L-B-E-L. -E -E I'm the Director of Hospital Epidemiology and Infection Control for the Cook County Health and Hospital System. Uh, do you want to speak to that, the health department? Sure. Uh, my name is uh, Kieran Joshi, K-I-R-A-N is my first name. Last name is Joshi, J-O-S-H-I. I'm an attending physician with the Cook County Department of Public Health. I just wanted to make um, one additional point uh, to add on to uh, uh, Dr. Wellbell's earlier statement about vaccine effectiveness. So even with vaccine effectiveness in the range of 30 to 60 percent, CDC estimates that um, uh, flu vaccination prevents millions of illnesses, millions, and tens of thousands of flu-related hospitalizations each year. Why do you have 
No, so um, I, I think the, the statement about the 32% number was from previous years. CDC does not release estimates about the current year until February, so we are not clear about what the effectiveness is for this year. So I, I'm, I'm not going to speak to that. No, no, we've not changed our operations other than to restrict visitation, as Dr. Wellbell alluded to earlier. So again, we keep uh, part of the point of our comments this morning is to show how the health system and the public health department work together to monitor signals and trends in any contagious illnesses, including influenza. And only if we see something that is going to cause a serious disruption to our services will we need to do that. Now, I would point out, as Dr. Wellbell alluded to earlier, this season, even this season, we are seeing significant illnesses. We've got individuals who have required intensive care unit care within Stroger Hospital because of cases of influenza this year. So the point of people getting out early, uh, getting vaccinated, and if they develop symptoms of influenza, again, the characteristic symptoms, as Dr. Wellbell pointed out, in addition to the usual cold symptoms, High fever, body aches, and headache would be symptoms that should prompt someone to reach out to their medical provider. I'm going to ask Dr. Feagan to speak to the question that was raised about the ability to get the flu vaccine. Dr. Shannon, could you say and spell your name and your title again? It's Shannon, like the river. And J-A-Y. J-A-Y, yep. You've been spelled Shannon, too. S-H-A-N-N-O-N. And your title again? I'm the chief executive officer for the system. And I'm Dr. Claudia Feagan, Efferson Father, E-G-A-N. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the Health System, and we provide influenza vaccine to all our patients. And as you know, we take care of all patients regardless of their ability to pay, so that any patient wants to walk into any of our clinics can receive an influenza vaccine. Our data of, as of this time shows that influenza activity is widespread throughout all municipalities in suburban Cook County. So you're not really seeing a spike in one area? Here. Not at this time. And while you're there, can you give us clarity on one thing? So it's back to the 1,500 mm -hmm. laboratory specimens. We shouldn't say suburban Cook County. You say Chicago land area, but that for a lot of people also means the city of Chicago. These numbers include the city of Chicago. Most likely. These numbers come to us from the systems that treat these patients. Um, so, for example, like the Cook County Health and Hospital Systems, their patients may come from suburban Cook, they may come from Chicago, they may come from outside of Cook County. They're simply aggregating the data for us and sending it to us. Can you speak also this for a second, Kelly? So, as, as you might understand from the way that uh, Ms. Bemis was responding to that, the public health monitoring of this is voluntary. It's not required. It comes up typically through any number of health departments. So across the state, there are a variety of health departments. The city has its own public health department. We have the public health function for the majority of suburban Cook County. All of that information subsequently flows up to the Illinois Department of Public Health and similarly on from there to the CDC. And that's how these trending data at a local, regional, and then at a federal level are monitored. Given the uh, spikes you've seen in the last couple of weeks, yeah. is it Yeah, uh, I mean, that's certainly a factor. Uh, kids are off from school. People may be congregating, but, but as has been said, it's widespread throughout the country. So we have reached a certain mass where there are many, many people who are infected and able to transmit the virus. Don't know. Yeah, I mean, so clearly Australia, they've had their season. Um, and sure, we look at what they experience to inform what might happen here. There's not always a perfect correlation, but more information is always better. Yeah, so they, it, as was uh, alluded to, they 
the information that we've received, and I'm certainly not privy to, to their information other than what I hear on the news or through speakers, is that they feel that their vaccine had about 10% efficacy this year. Well, hi, <clears throat> my name is David Schwartz, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z. I am the chair, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm the chair of infectious diseases for the health system, so the clinical part. Um, with regard to why is this a bad flu year, and uh, last year was not so bad, um, if I could tell you that accurately, I would hold a more prominent position. The fact is, <laughs> it just, it isn't known. It, it isn't known why uh, the virus behaves this way. Um, and, uh, and it is true that, you know, southern hemisphere flu seasons often predict what the northern hemisphere will, uh, will experience, and, and that occurred also. Um, with regard to the helpfulness of the flu vaccine, I would point out uh, a, a few things. One is that, as has been uh, emphasized, we do not yet know, have a well-crafted uh, scientific uh, measure of effectiveness of the vaccine this year. Um, so it's, it's premature to say. Um, what is meant by 10 or 30 or 60% effectiveness is that a person who is vaccinated is that much less likely to acquire influenza illness of any kind, okay? Um, uh, but as has been alluded to, the benefits of vaccination go beyond the avoidance of influenza-like illness to include the attenuation or the amelioration of influenza-like illness also, so that those who are vaccinated, if they do get ill from flu, are less likely to have a ser serious illness. I'd also add in this context that, you know, if a healthy person gets influenza, it, it knocks you out. It's very unpleasant. Um, you lay in bed, you find it very un unsettling, you don't do anything, you don't go to work, um, and you're ill for an average of three to seven days, and then you get better and you go back to your life. If you have chronic disease, and there are many, many different types of chronic disease, or you are older, or you are very young, the risk of getting much, much sicker is that much higher. So your capacity to absorb a blow. Hi guys, if you are just joining us, that is what you see in the left corner of your screen. I know one of you made a comment that is, uh, or was a chopper shot of Gillette Stadium there in Foxborough, Massachusetts. Obviously Massachusetts has been just pummeled with snow as has the rest of New England. It was kind of a cool look at how some of the workers there were trying to uncover some of the seats from the snow. You really don't ex see this extent of how, what they have to go through, right, to get these stadiums cleared because the Patriots will be playing there, of course, in the coming couple of weeks. I think their next, their playoff game is next Saturday. So they have a little bit of time to make sure everything is clear, but um, the chopper is now panning out, so we'll go to some other coverage. But uh, we're continuing this coverage of a live press conference in Chicago, talking about flu season there what to um, expect and sort of what they're going through, some of the medical uh, basis around what they do to treat it in this season, in these cold, cold winter months. I was reading that I think it was negative one degree in Chicago this morning, so pretty cold out there. We're gonna have some more footage of um, various coastal areas that are covered in snow, continuous weather coverage as well, and then later on, uh, we're gonna have a guest call in from a local bookstore about the new book, Fire and Fury about the Trump administration that is selling out on shelves after uh, its publisher said, hey, release it early, we're gonna try to sell this thing, and um, and it's been definitely a, been a talker in this town. So we'll keep it on this snowy shot here of Massachusetts and simultaneously this press conference in Chicago for you guys to check in with what's happening uh, live here in Mass and Chicago. I say that that person's misguided and doesn't know what he or she is talking about. As Dr. Uh, Schwartz alluded to, there's still benefit of getting the vaccination this year. And as Dr. Wellbell alluded to, we have no idea when the peak is going to actually happen uh, for this season. You mean if you want to have a flu already? I'm sorry? You mean if, you have the flu if, you, if you have had influenza and you've been demonstrated to have influenza this year, it's probably not worthwhile to get a flu vaccine this year. If you've had a cold this year and you haven't been to see the doctor, getting a flu vaccine is a very good idea this year. Last question. What about the parents of children who are under the age of 15? Uh, they should be speaking with their pediatrician, but the most important thing for them is to make sure that they're using good 
hand hygiene and good cough and sneeze hygiene at home. And then if their child develops an illness, they should take their child to see a doctor. So thank you all for coming out this morning. Thank you. And uh, Kelly is going to show up. some of this video, but it was cool. I think they kind of backtracked it or around it to see the close-up on these seats covered in, in snow. In Check it out. It's Gillette Square. Stadium in Foxborough, Mass, right between Providence and Boston. And I was actually up there on New Year's Eve, so I was just there. And it's wild to think because we were in the midst of frigid temperatures. We battled a little bit of wind, but mostly it was just super, super cold. But we didn't actually see the physical snow. Um, or Boston rather didn't see it till later. Now they just switched the shot to Times Square. So we'll kind of jump around and give you some more snowy coverage from Maryland um, and the like. But also another story, guys, I don't know if you heard about this. The, um, the police officer, this is live in Highlands Park, Colorado. You heard about this, the fallen officer, the deputy Zachary Parrish. Um, this is his service. It was planned for today, Friday. He was killed in an ambush attack um, on New Year's Eve when he was responding to a domestic disturbance in that area, um, like I said, at, in Colorado. So if you guys are familiar with the area, maybe you are, look at that procession. That's what you're looking at here. This is a live um, visual here of his service and the family procession onto the church, etc. This was an, a hot topic story because it was another scenario where we had sort of an innocent 29-year-old police officer who was killed in this ambush. He had a wife and two kids. Um, and uh, it's, it's an extremely sad story. So there was a memorial on Monday, and this is the official service in the Highlands Park.
All right, guys, and that footage will probably pan out a little further. Obviously, a very, very sad story in Colorado that happened on New Year's Eve. We still have that coming in. Um, you can tell it was just quite a big ceremony. Uh, the American flag there raised tons of cards in that procession, and T and I were just kind of chatting about what we saw there. And just so many police, of course, police officers in the force coming out to honor the fallen officer there. But changing gears a little bit, guys, in the news today, uh, let's go over to sort of the arts and entertainment news. In music, Justin Timberlake dropped his new single. He did announce that he will be releasing his new album on, I believe, February 2nd, which is prior to the Super Bowl. Yes. Um, and he released a new single today on Spotify called Filthy. We were just listening to it and trying to trying to kind of give a review and evaluate it. And T kind of came around. He wasn't originally a big fan of JT, but you like this song. Right, right. right. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not that big of a fan of Justin Timberlake. Um, I like his music, don't get me wrong. Uh, but w when I first heard it, you know, the initial, when you initially hear that, that filthy track, it's more like, like it's, it's, it's kind of everywhere. The production is like just, all you hear is instruments, but then it kind of goes mm -hmm. into where Justin Timberlake is singing. And it's a, it's a, it, I like the beat. Timberland did a very nice job on it. Uh -huh. Um, I think, I think. It sounds very futuristic. It's like it does kind of. I was gonna say the same thing. I'm just gonna put this up so people know what we're talking about. Um, he has definitely come a long way, I think, in his music. Yeah, um, I mean, he's he's accomplished a lot in his career already. I think mm -hmm. the Super Bowl again. I, I wonder why they. First of all, I wonder why they're giving him a chance and not Janet Jackson. But that's totally other news. Um, it's in question when he got the sort of assignment to be the halftime show and everyone was talking about it. Everyone started to speculate, hey, is Janet Jackson going to make an appearance? We still, a lot of people still think, yeah. And you know, you they, know? they also like canceled a lot of, like they, they after the Justin Timberlake, Janet Jackson thing. They, I remember that so they, well. They stopped, you know, um, using like rap artists for a while and like. And they you went know. right a lot of pop. Yeah, they went straight Gaga, to Bruno Beyonce. Mars and Beyonce. And that's stuff. right, that's right. But Justin, um, I think, oh yeah, I was gonna say, go ahead. I was gonna say with his new beats. Oh yeah, the 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 new. I think I think like I was saying, he he's accomplished a lot in his time. Um, he's he's done. He gave us a lot of great music. Mm -hmm. I think I think now this is like a different lane for him. He's just trying to expand, go beyond that. You know, with a different sound, the different same producer Timbaland, mm -hmm. the goat. But just just try to, you know, I guess advance his sound a little more. Yep. Not not just a you know, he's not like that boy band singer anymore, you know. He's totally. he's more and like hasn't been. right. Yeah, he hasn't been for a while, but now it's just like yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what's the album called? Man in the Woods or it's something? It's called Man in the Woods and that's Man the thing. He's taking on sort of a new not necessarily a genre, because like you said, the producer, the production, Timbaland's going to be the similar beat, and we were actually just listening to the song. You can really pull out that beat if you're a fan. Even if you're not, you kind of recognize his music style. Yeah. We don't have the rights, obviously, to play the whole thing, but we can play like 10 seconds of it, so we can do that um, to kind of show you. But if you've heard it, maybe you've listened on Spotify or on some other app, if you have any thoughts on it, um, or maybe you don't care and you don't like JT, let us know in the comments. We're curious, because people are kind of all over with this. But he's, he's in the news because... He's kind of um, segueing into releasing his full album. That will be released just prior, I think, to the Super Bowl, and then he performs ha at halftime. It's crazy. It <laughs> seems like every time Justin Timberlake releases a new album or he's coming out with something, it's like mm. the world is watching. Like, it is. It's, it's like a big deal. I, Him and for me, Smith, for me personally, I it's, yeah, I don't, I don't feel that. It's like I have. I get excited when certain artists are for about sure. to come out. You know, but JT's right. not one of them. And I think that's right. That's totally valid. I think. You know, we see which artists sort of surge in the news when these things happen, when they tease, you know, they send out a teaser of one of their singles, Taylor Swift, JT. So, all right, here's the 10 seconds that I got. <laughs> Put it on the mic. Five, three, two, one. All right, little, little tiny segment, little tiny big teaser, Man. right? You guys have probably listened to the whole thing. Or uh, maybe you haven't, but if you do, stream it. Uh, yeah, you can check uh, it out. You put it up there. Like, unlike other artists who kind of don't let their stuff be put out. On, you know, there's some people that kind of hide it from the yeah. Super Bowl apps because mm -hmm. they want but, you know the purchases and but stuff. But this will only benefit him and you know his it publishing, will. his label. I think um, you know because now streaming is count accounted for mm -hmm. for the RIAA. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if he'll get like a million streams or whatever, then he'll go platinum and, you know, he'll, yeah. he'll make money off of it. So we were just looking at um, aerial footage of Gillette Stadium covered in snow. In sports news, ESPN released a um, article today talking about, we reported this on air this morning, it made enough news to make a segment out of this, but talking about the trio of Bill, Bill, Bill Belichick, Robert Kraft, and Tom Brady, and that there actually is inner feuding and there's disagreements and that this and that happened behind the scenes in the locker room. Now, the interesting thing about this, and ESPN is, is getting comments on both sides of the story, but they're getting a little heat saying, and, and this is valid, there are no credited, like, named sources. Everything is off the record in it. So a lot of people are saying, hey, no named sources, no credibility. Um, other people are saying ESPN is, is back with this, like, big piece. Everyone needs to read it. Some people are saying it's just for press for them. I mean, it's interesting. So speaking of what we were just looking at, so that stadium news, there's that news in football as we go into sort of the heightened – time of playoff season and then into the Super Bowl in February but so crazy that I was just there and it was so covered in it was just now so covered in snow but it was freezing on New Year's Eve and it's still really really cold there yeah um I wish you could put that shot of you in Gillette Stadium you had it looked like you had some nice seats I too I did let me um, see if I can find it I can go to my Instagram we had a good time I mean not to make this all about sort of my trip but like just to be there right before the bomb cyclone hit up and down the east coast I was telling you guys yesterday my parents got hit with Eight to 14 inches of snow in um, the Rhode Island coastal area, and then up in Massachusetts, same thing. So let me see if I can find it. Me at Gillette. <laughs> I had some cool seats. It was fun. But yeah, how have you been battling the cold? Uh, the, the cold has been okay for me. Um, again, it's just tough getting out of bed in the morning now. But um, <laughs> now it's so freezing. But yeah, Gillette Stadium. I'm. I can't imagine. I'm. Sh you look like you're bundled up in that picture, actually. I know. I really, really was. Let me put it there. Um. So this is a picture, literally, a week plus. Uh, not even a week ago. This was New Year's Eve. Um. <laughs> totally. But I don't think I'm even bundled enough in that photo. I had layers and layers. The key is your extremities, right? Your feet. Even if you have these like thinsulate, thinsulate yeah. thermal, whatever linings, you need to move your toes to stay warm. And so, you know, the gloves thing helps, hand warmers help, but your feet are really what get it. And so a lot of people left the stadium because they just couldn't get warm, you know, in their extremities. And as you can see, there is a ton of red open seats. I know. This is towards the end. I will tell you, I'll pro <laughs> prove it towards the end because look at that beer in my right hand is completely frozen. The one in my wow. left was something we were trying to sip on, but you know, you couldn't even really get through drinking and eating because it was so freezing, but you could see a lot of people did leave um, at the end and um, it was just so, so cold. But hey, that's the vortex, you know, the, the freezing. The vortex, yes. The freezing New England days. But yeah, I made it back, luckily, okay before the whole storm, but. So so Robert Kraft and, and, and the article, Bill Belcher. I, I will admit I'm only about halfway through the article and I knew it came out at midnight last night and people are talking about it and I was like, I want to get on board so I know what people are saying. Um, and it's interesting, you know, it, it sort of pulls together the the chatter among the three and the emotions of them and who was on whose side, whom was on whose side, and then also um, the forcing out of backup court, quarterback Jimmy Garoppolo. They're saying that you know Tom Brady, the quarterback there for numerous years now, 17 plus, who's 40 years old now, that he sort of wanted it and sort of pushed it on the coach to kind of get him out of there. And you know, it brings it brings to light a lot of questions. Um, uh but a lot of people are saying this is invalid. You know, this isn't a, the article isn't. First of all, I think I think it's more like rumors happening, and I'm not a Patriots fan at all. But mm -hmm. I, th I think it's like rumors amidst um, playoff. You know, they're just trying to make some controversy, if anything. Mm -hmm. um, if if Tom Brady did want Jimmy Garoppolo off of the team, um, and I don't think he d does, because he's got the starting position for life. You know, until he's officially over. I don't see why and that's what why he would think, want you know if if anything like he, I mean I don't he could put Garoppolo under his wing and mm -hmm. all that and you know just teach him the ropes and you know yeah. then but but also it, just getting rid of Garoppolo I think that was a genius in Bill Belichick I think I think Bill Belichick knows what he's doing with his team like he is that's what you've been saying he, yes, he's a, a non fan yeah he, Bill, as a non fan Bill Belichick is a mastermind when it comes to football. So I think, you know, it's definitely a, the head coach's call to move some players, shift them, you know, left mm -hmm. and right. Um, so I, I don't think Tom Brady had anything to do with anything with Garoppolo leaving. Yeah, that's um, incredible. Yeah. 
I think I think it was definitely if it was probably just you know salary cap issue even like mm. they probably just couldn't afford him. Um, interesting. He's also yeah. if if the Patriots do win, then he then Garoppolo still gets paid. Um, oh, we were talking about this yeah. salaries and stuff. Yep. Yeah, it's all really interesting. I mean, there's a lot of speculation as to that portion of it. Or what you're gonna say the. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I think it's it's just fake, basically. I don't think it's it's that actually. They, they want some press. I mean, that's sort of the yeah. whole. I, the reason, and not to get into the nitty gritty of what the, it says, because I haven't even finished reading it, but it became sort of a, a national news segment, I guess you could say. We even reported it as one of our news items this morning, because um, whether or not you're from there or a fan or whatever, it, this is sort of a, a heated thing in, I guess, sports or in football news about this trio. You know, they're known to, for other reasons too. Robert Kraft and. Belichick were known to come to the White House and be friendly with Trump. Oh, yeah. Brady was officially close and friendly with Trump, but then I remember he sort of denounced one of Trump's tweets as well. So there's been, um, there's definitely been both sides of that. So he's kind of coming to the pol- political world by visiting, you know, DC and of course. Well, that's a good point. The championship. So that's a good point. I guess there's a lot of relevance to those these figures at on the Patriots. Um, but yeah, the other people are saying, "Hey, this is just news because it's the press, or it's this sports outlet, you know, wanting to get more." Yeah, and it, and it's, and it's also playoff time for football, so it's, it's an like time of year, right? Yeah, so it's like you know, Start not n- not many other teams are being talked about <laughs> right now. Mm-hmm. So I can definitely see why they're talking about the Patriots again, as they're basically repeating what they did last year, um, <clears throat> and. Well, they're on the path to repeating what they did last year. Yeah, we'll see how it all goes. I think I think the Patriots or someone officially did issue a statement. I can't seem to find it right now, the, the in response to it. But the article dropped around midnight or one a.m. last night. Lots of people reading it this morning. So if you're interested, encouraging you to kind of get in in on that because that's been sort of a talker yeah. today. As has the Justin Timberlake single, totally different thing. Also, it's seventy four days till spring today, guys. So happy. <laughs> We're into winter, but we still got 74 days to go. Yay, so we know we're hoping there. for nothing too crazy. <laughs> a live look at Ocean City, Maryland right now, which is what we were tracking yesterday. Oh, Super wow. cold at the boardwalk there. Oh, now it's buffering. There we go. There's well, the movement. Do you, I'm not sure if our viewers remember the previous picture before the storm came. It was clear it was, boardwalk. It was clear boardwalk. It was empty. I think it was like one person walking in the whole thing. Um, yeah, you guys can see in the lower left, it's Ocean City Live Cam. We have a little issue with the stream, but it's kind of in and out. Ocean City turned that into That is something you never see. I mean, ice. I, you never see it covered in snow. It's a beach, snow day, popular in the summer, um, a famous boardwalk, and, and there it is, covered it, in snow. You could see a little bit of blue on the top right. <laughs> So the I, don't ocean? Th- I don't think that portion. No, it's is moving. Frozen. You can see some of the wave. Yeah. You definitely can see the waves coming in. I mean, it's not. So the beaches don't if, freeze. Right. I think because of there's a scientific thing about it's the moving, waves coming in. It's moving, yeah. Okay. But there are portions. I, I don't know if you guys saw this, but a fourth shark froze to death off the coast, I believe, of Cape Cod or New England area. Right. Um, and they were talking about how this is just a crazy phenomenon. These sharks, it's so bad, they're dying from cold shock. And then getting washed up. That's crazy. It's kind of like, um, I remember when certain parts in the U.S. where like birds were flying off the sky, like they were just dying, right. like tons of them in in groups. Mm-hmm. Um, in Iran saying it's so cold, the webcam stream is frozen. That actually is not a bad thought. I'm actually thinking there could be something to do with that. We were talking about at the game how the iPads weren't working to to ring you out with your credit card. And obviously, don't ever leave your phone in the car when it's freezing. Yeah. Um, it's you know important to kind of to know that some things. Yeah, I mean, just freeze up, right? I don't know what's powering it, but yeah, if it if it's de- it if it, if it's powered by batteries, then it's definitely the cold. Oh, yeah. then that's very well possibly true. Batteries right? and cold weather do not go together. That's interesting. Um, kind of hear what we just got in. Yeah, we just got a sort of word that Dick Durbin, senator from Illinois, is talking right now on a feed that's coming in live. So maybe we'll jump over there just to see what he has to see what he's talking about because I, I wasn't aware of this coming down. But um, we're going to continue on with some live and breaking news, guys. Um, stay tuned because at the one o'clock hour, this is actually really exciting. Local bookstore owner Steve Salis is going to be joining us on the phone to chat about uh, their selling of this book, Fire and Fury. It's about the Trump administration. We've been talking about it. It sold out in a matter of what I believe is to be 15 minutes. We're going to verify that with him and just talk about sort of what that's like 
to have people waiting on your book that you weren't even planning on selling till today. They opened up last night, or they stayed open rather, because they open, you know, they stay open late. And it's really cool to see sort of local business thriving like this. And we're going to talk to them more about what it means for for their bookstore, for the community, and um, the book itself, because it's been definitely a big talker with comments from Steve Bannon and the like, and some of Trump's close advisors and aides making um, some salacious comments, according to reports, in the book. So we'll get more of the rundown from the owner of that bookstore coming up at 1 o'clock Eastern. Um, but for now, uh, we still have some footage of that funeral service in Colorado, and also Dick Durbin, senator from Illinois, who's speaking right now. So let's go over to that and uh, let's see what he has to say. Thanks, right? Mom. Thanks, Steve. Things we can do. Uh, for example, uh, going out on a limb here, and I, I, I want to qualify this by saying I'm a liberal arts lawyer. I'm not a public health person. I'm not a nurse practitioner. But it appears that the challenge is in some of the facilities on the campus are older facilities with older plumbing. And that's where we're seeing recurring evidence of this Legionnaire's disease. So it isn't a matter of replacing all the plumbing on the campus here, but I think really focusing on those areas where it appears to be more prevalent, more likely, that would be a good investment to, re to repair slash replace the plumbing in these facilities so that there are no questions that we've done everything we can for these veterans. And generally the takeaway after having this, how long did you speak to the governor and what was your major takeaway from that meeting with him? You're, you have a sense of urgency. I guess, is that sense of urgency just the same on the state side? Well, I, here's what I said to the governor and to the leader of the Veterans uh, Department for our state. I said, first, in no way, shape, or form can we declare mission accomplished. We're finished here. And they agreed completely with that. Uh, there still is a challenge remaining, and we have to face it. And secondly, we cannot dismiss this as a problem that is prevalent, uh, not just here, but all over uh, uh, nursing facilities, veterans facilities, even homes in our state. Something happened here that draws our attention to the reality of the threat, and it, it calls our attention to do something about it. So the fact that the governor would take time out of his schedule to physically be here for days, I hope will lead to his uh, public conversation with the people of Illinois and with the veterans about what the state is going to do next. And as I said, I want to join him, as does Senator Duckworth, on a bipartisan basis to get that done. So just to be clear, you think that parts of the plumbing, parts of the infrastructure need to be fixed or replaced, but not all of I, it? Like I said, let, let me draw a line here and tell you I am not public health qualified, but this much I know. In one particular building on campus, the CDC found evidence of the same strain of Legionella bacteria that was bacteria, am I right? Stop me any time, <laughs> she's my, my public. Found the same strain of Legionella bacteria that resulted in deaths in 2015, okay? In the same place. That to me is a red light warning right there. Something is going on in this facility that needs to be uh, looked at, uh, I'm told it's galvanized plumbing, the possibly the oldest plumbing on campus here. Uh, and I would say that's that's a red light for Our me. Our mayor was, was on record yesterday saying you know, he wants to keep the best home open, that it's an important driver for the economy and it's really important that we have been formed to advance that. Um, but there was no talk about veterans care in, in that conversation, more about how can we keep the best home around for the economy around here? What do you think about that focus? I hope that every elected official who addresses this challenge will start with what I said. Our first commitment is to the safety of the veterans living here. That is the most important thing, and the staff uh, living and working here. That is our first priority. Is this an important part of Quincy's history and its economy? Yes, it is. Almost 500 people work here. I represented this community. I know what it means. They're proud to work here and proud to help our veterans. Uh, and I stand by uh, this mayor's bipartisan committee that wants to keep uh, the Quincy Veterans Home open, but I want to couple that with a commitment to make it the safest veterans facility in the nation, not just the state. Just a couple more. Given, given that the CDC in its report says a complete eradic eradication of the Legionella may not be possible because it's such an old facility, that has to make you pause and reconsider. I know it's a 
big job provider. It's very special to the community here. It's special to the residents, the people who work here. But the CDC is saying you may not be able to guarantee that more people won't get sick from the Legionella. Well, uh, we should have zero tolerance, but we should also be honest about it. We'll do everything medically, uh, humanly possible to keep this facility safe. Uh, can we guarantee 100% no? We can't. I don't think anyone in public health would even go that far. Uh, and, but let us do more. I mean, the challenges here are special. The number of fatalities and people infected have reached a level where we have to pay special attention to it here. Okay? Thanks, everybody. I'm glad you were here. <laughs> Wires can only go so far with this. <laughs> I'm going to say hello to some of these folks. Thank you, Senator. Right, you I'll, I'll walk away.
Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Zach's family and um, the Douglas County Sheriff's Department, we thank you for being here. Uh, we are so blessed. The family has been blown away by the support of the community, and so we thank you for your presence here. Uh, we are a few minutes away from beginning. Uh, the family is here. Uh, we have had a few private moments to, uh, to reflect and to remember Zach. Before we begin the formal ceremonies, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Craig Smith. I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor at Mission Hills Church, which is Zach and Gracie's church. And I'll be your master of ceremonies today. Uh, for the friends, family, neighbors, and community members joining us both here and via media outlets, we want you to, to know that you're an important part of the ceremony today, and we're very glad that you're here. This may be your first law enforcement service, and so I'd like to give you a brief overview of what's to come today. Uh, this is a law enforcement ceremony, and it is steeped with traditions and honors. Many of these traditions come directly from military services where remembrances and honor are bestowed upon those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for their community and the country. Throughout the service, you will see a number of different activities taking place. Each one is a ritual with its own significance. Just know that each piece of the service is based on the wishes of the fallen deputy and his family. It also follows the traditions of our law enforcement profession. The Honor Guard Commander will be giving preparatory commands for standing, sitting, and saluting at key points. When requested to stand, everyone may rise. All uniform personnel are requested to stand at attention. For your participation, uniform personnel will display a military-style hand salute when the command present arms is given. Non-uniform personnel or community members may place their hand over their heart. Salutes are to be held until the order arms has been given by the honor guard. The service will begin in a few minutes. Thank you.
All right, guys, so thanks for staying on with us. We are going to switch topics a little bit. We'll go back to this service in just a little bit to make sure we catch the bulk of that because I know it hasn't started yet, so sorry about that timing. But we're taking it back into the newsroom to talk about um, this book that you see, well, rather, you see the sold out sign on Kramer Books' um, glass door window there. That's a local bookstore here in DC. It is quite renowned. I'm very familiar with it myself. And we're gonna be talking to um, the owner of Kramer Books, Steve Salis, who is gonna be on the phone with us in just a moment. Steve, are you there with us now? He's calling I'm me. here. There Happy he New is. Year, hey, Mom. Steve. Hey, good to hear from you. Nice to hear from you as well. Awesome. So I'm gonna bring up two shots right now, and one is the tweet that you guys put out um, last night, and then one is just a picture that we took. We had our reporter, Bob Barnard, there on site this morning to talk about the sellout of that book last night at midnight. Okay, so first, Steve, you gotta tell me, um, what has this ever happened before? I mean, you guys do this sometimes, right? Where you have these midnight releases and then people swarm the store and it's gone. Like, tell me about that experience. Yeah, we, we have done this in the past. The difference between those and this time around was initially this was going to be released on Tuesday. And with all the stuff that's been going on around the book, the publishing house decided to, to launch today. We had copies in store and I give a lot of credit to our book team. We decided just on the whim to, to go out at midnight and take advantage of the fact we're open late and push the book out to our, our audiences. Yeah, that's great. So people were out, I mean, I've seen your tweet, people were brave in the cold to come out there. You guys close at 1 a.m., right? Yeah, on the weekdays we close at 1 a.m. and on the weekends we close around 3.30. And yes, a lot of people brave the cold last night to come out and we sold out within two minutes. So how, tell me how many copies you had and then and just how many people you seem to see in the store. Was it was it like mayhem? We have a picture here, and it sort of tells me what it looks like. Was it, how many copies exactly? Yeah, so we're still figuring that out right now because it's a, it's a very fluid situation, but we sold many, many, many copies. Okay, yeah, and I was also hearing rumblings that you guys were getting another shipment in today, is that right? Those rumblings, correct. I'm sorry, excuse me, those rumblings are incorrect. Oh. Uh, I don't believe that we'll be getting any today. Uh, we are planning to have a large shipment on Monday. Uh, that's what's part because of what's happening with these red books. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm reading to the book is already number one on Amazon. Tons of people are talking about it. Fire and Fury Inside the Trump White House by Michael Wolff. Um, so I'm curious, what do you think this says about sort of, I guess, the community of DC, right? The local bookstore goers, um, what people are sort of reading in on studying. What do you think it says about the people? Well, I think Michael's illustrious history of Kennedy, uh, Hollywood Reporter, you. I think it goes to show you that you know, a bookstore like Kermit Books is still thrive in the economy with all the other uh, ways that people can consume our products. And uh, we're alive and well. And it's really been a, a fortunate thing to see how many people still want to come and the actual physical book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. It's breaking up a little bit here, but I, I still kind of got the gist of what you said, Steve. Talking about really the um, longtime establishment of Kramer Books in DuPont Circle in DC. It totally is a renowned bookstore here, and we're so grateful to be able to chat with you and uh, hear more about this. But um, do you expect any more of these kind of bursts of, um, I guess, books coming out that you guys will do advanced sort of selling of, or anything in your in your pipeline that you're thinking about? Or you never really know. Uh, as of now, there's on the docket at the book place. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, Steve, I know you're busy and you run in the bookstore and the cafe and the bar there, so we'll leave you to go on with your Friday, but thanks so much for chatting with us. Thank you so much for having me. Great to hear your voice. Have oh, a wonderful cool. week. Thanks, Steve. Good to see you from you. Bye. Thanks. Cool. Well, that's a good time. So Steve um, Salis, who I'm actually familiar with, I know him, from um, the bookstore and just from, from knowing it very well. It's very close to my heart and it's a great bookstore down in DuPont um, and they uh, sold out of their copies. So we'll see, I guess the rumblings, we weren't really sure if they were true, if they were getting more copies of that in. So still a lot of questions about the numbers to be answered, but you can see the picture of uh, the sold out sign on the uh, door there. And we'll have to see where we go from here. Lots of people interested in reading it. We were reading that it was a varied amount, of course, of government employees who were grabbing this. Um, you know that the media is there to grab it as well so uh, we'll see how it actually does when it's fully stocked there and for sale um, and that was Steve Salis so good to hear from him guys we're gonna go back to the services the funeral services in Highlands Park uh, Colorado for the officer who was involved in that ambush on New Year's Eve
so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call
Okay guys, back in the newsroom here. Apologies that some of this stuff is slow to start today. We don't have a ton and ton of stuff that we're looking at to stream, but I hope that you were able to join us for that cool interview with the owner of Kramer Books, which was awesome to hear from him. Um, I was starting to break up in the phone connection there with him, so I was hoping to maybe get a few answers out of him and then um, and then obviously bring you back to the service, but it unfortunately hasn't started up yet. But a lot of really interesting information, really a testament to the community here in DC who are using um, their resources here in the local um, retail bookstore world, right? These small bookstores are still thriving. There's a couple of them still around in DC. Kramer Books, of course, I have a big affinity for, and it's it's doing so well. And they're known for having these sort of hot ticket, hot items um, released the night before they're officially out and published for the public. Like I mentioned, A Fire and Fury inside the Trump White House is out today. It's already sold out on Amazon. Um, we've been talking about it this morning, and I think the biggest sort of news is that there's a testament that people are interested in this kind of stuff, right? People are talking on one side. There are apparently some salacious comments inside the book, and Trump himself has sort of denounced it. The, the White House has come out and denounced it, so people are getting excited about that, and they want to get their hands on a copy to see what they think about it. Um, so it's pretty interesting. We'll be following this a little bit more as well. Um, of course, we follow a lot of politics here. We stream President Trump a lot and other people in his administration, so it's relevant to some of the stuff we cover. Um, and the big news this, this week was that Steve Bannon had some comments in the book that Trump um, later said, hey, he just said I was a good guy. I guess he went against that. And so there is some contention there, which I think the public finds pretty fascinating. So lots of people trying to get their hands on this book. Like I said, sold out at Kramer's. Um, and uh, we'll see where the future where the future is. Even Steve did, wasn't quite sure what the next shipment exactly was going to be or how many. They didn't give us an exact number, but we'll kind of keep our eye on that to see where that goes as people are reading uh, into today's news and politics. So we'll jump back into the service. Um, hopefully it does start up shortly um, and keep you in the know. If we have anything else live and breaking, any big newsers on the weather, um, as we know, lots of severe weather up and down the East Coast. We will bring you over there and anything else that we have, live and breaking news, guys, we're going to bring you the videos for your viewing this afternoon on this Friday. So happy Friday and thanks for hanging out with me here in the digital newsroom, guys.
Okay, guys, we'll take a moment and come back into the newsroom here at Fox 5 Local News Digital. As you guys know, we're dealing with some majorly freezing temps all across the eastern seaboard here in D.C. Take a look at the White House. Somehow, they do something to that fountain that it's okay. It's still flowing in the front of the White House there, but it is so frigid out today, guys. The wind chill is dropped down into, like, the single digits. Um, it's super, super freezing. And one of the sad outcomes of some of this is that animals are being threatened wherever it's freezing abnormally and actually some of the news here today three dogs were found dead at a kennel in north carolina while others were bleeding and suffering from these freezing cold temperatures um the owner was actually charged with 33 counts of animal cruelty here's a little story on it um right here Heartbreaking. Watch police carry out crates with three deceased dogs. It looks like either they were in a fight with each other or in a fight with another animal. Captain Vidal Seip with Hickory Police says there was little food or water, many of the bowls empty, with only one space heater inside. The floor covered in blood. There are some that were bleeding. There's a lot of blood that was inside. Uh, and on the animals. Officers rescued 30 other American bully dogs and puppies from this business on 7th Avenue Place Southwest in Hickory. The dogs were malnourished. Um, some of them had infections, open wounds. Animal control took them to the county animal shelter where they will remain as evidence. The owner of the dogs, Daniel Pride, is facing 33 counts of felony animal cruelty, among other firearm and drug charges. His girlfriend, Alexandra Schufer, says that he was breeding and selling the American bully dogs through his business, Cashline Kennels. None of them were neglected. They've been fed. If you go on the website, K-A-S-H, Line Kennels, you will see beautiful pictures of dogs and how well-loved they are. She says each pup would go for anywhere between $300 and $2,500. Schufer says her boyfriend moved the dogs from their house to this building on New Year's Day and explains how she thinks three of them ended up dead. He thinks that one of them might have got loose. They got close to one of the puppies, and the other a dog reacted. Police say Pride rented this building and applied for a permit to open a kennel. Now he's at Catawba County Detention Center on more than $100,000 bond. So some pretty sad news there with the um, dogs there in uh, North Carolina, but in the same vein, guys, also in North Carolina, in Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, there's another story about a puppy freezing to death overnight after this bitter storm. Um, there's really frigid air, uh, weather gripping that area, and so Animal Care and Control is con uh, investigating a lot of cold weather complaints in North Carolina. Here's that story. Mecklenburg Animal Control. It's very cold. You gotta keep bundled up. Officer Matt Marler has investigated animal cruelty for more than a decade. Send me the cruelty call on Esmeralda, please. And says when the temps drop, the dog has ice on its nose. Abuse complaints go up, carrying yeah, fines up to five hundred dollars. We're bundled up with jackets. They have nothing. Animal control is investigating after a puppy was found frozen to death Wednesday morning. Two other puppies survived. Marler's on a mission to prevent that from happening to other animals. Hey, pup. Hey, baby. By law, animals can be kept out. Yeah. Outside, but they need to have access to shelter, bedding, and water, which this pit full mix has. Keep an eye on that water, make sure it's not frozen. Right, and I poured hot water in there earlier, you know, to yeah. make it, but it freezes up. Just so. bust it, come out here and bust it up right. every once in a while. The dog appears healthy. Sorry to bother you. So we head to our next call. There's four dogs outside barking left in the cold. <laughs> here, like the previous call, everything checks out. You say they got right. right, I'm just here to check it out. But due to the cold, the dog's water is frozen. So just whenever you get a minute, just get yeah. some fresh water in there. An animal lover, Marler says he takes this personally and is glad when a complaint turns out not to be a concern. That's what matters, that they're warm. As the temperatures drop, Animal Control says they'll provide straw for bedding and dog shelters for those who can't afford it. So definitely some serious, desperate, very sad news there with it when it comes to animals and dogs specifically in this cold weather. But we have to end both of those stories coming together with something that's positive on a really, really cute positive note. This puppy loves sledding and her owner said she's did this 50 times this is from our chicago market check it out let me find this video for you it's too cute check out this sledding dog 
Yeah. She she brought that up the hill her, herself and, and went back down with it multiple times. Ever seen anything like that? Take a look. All right, so that was actually from our sister station in LA, Fox LA, Los Angeles. But cute little video to at least end some of those sad stories about uh, animals suffering in these cold temperatures. But we're gonna keep going, guys. Anything that we have that's live and breaking, we'll bring it to you. Uh, we're still watching, and this funeral service has officially started for the slain officer, uh, Zachary Parrish, in Colorado. He was killed on New Year's Eve when he was uh, responding to a domestic disturbance in Colorado. So more on his life and sort of the circumstances surrounding that from some of these people who are speaking. We saw a ton of officers lining up, cars just lining the streets there in Highlands Park, Colorado, for, uh, Highlands Ranch rather, uh, Colorado for this service. So we'll go over there and, and until we have anything else that's pressing or breaking coming down our stream uh, a video for you guys. Writes about what happens when a believer dies. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. One last passage. The night before Jesus went to the cross, he told his followers that he was going to leave them. And they were very troubled by that. And so Jesus said this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's, <clears throat> in my father's house are many dwelling places, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place, prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me where I am. You know the place where I'm going. And Thomas said, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Those are words that Zach greatly believed in.
Okay, guys, we will take you back to the service when there's some more kind of action going on or some speakers. Um, I want to show you another, not to be harping on the dog topic, but there's so many dog stories out there. Of course, some sad, some happy, really cute videos that we put out there that are viral. But hey, check this story out. Also from our sister station in LA, Fox 11, uh, a groomer actually mistakenly gave away a dog to a man who pretended to be the relative of the dog's owner. So some shicey business going on there. The whole thing was caught on video. Here's the story they put together about that. Check this out. Video catches a dog thief in action. A young man approaches a dog groomer and strikes up a conversation. The two of them take turns pointing at different dogs until Pebbles, the pink-eared Shih Tzu, is placed on the counter and scooped up by the mystery man. If you look in the video, he kind of pointed at a whole bunch of different dogs. And she just, you know, kind of just offered up our dog and gave it to him. The groomer helps secure the leash and Pebbles is ready to hit the road. But all is not okay because that man isn't Pebbles' owner. Laura Taylor is. She called me at 4.30, said your dogs are ready. I said I'll be right there. And when I got there, she only had one dog. It happened here at Doggy Doos near Olympic and Crenshaw in Koreatown. That's where Taylor had been taking Pebbles for years without any issues. When I stopped by, the groomer told me this incident was all a mistake. She says the man in the video claimed to be Taylor's nephew, which was her explanation to Taylor as well. She said, she, uh, oh, I gave it to your nephew. And I'm like, no, he's sleeping. He's not here. And that's when they decided to look at the tape. First of all, I'm like, who is he? She's like, you don't know him? I'm like, no, I do not know him at all. I've never seen this guy before. Immediately, Taylor began posting flyers all around town with the man's face and a photo of Pebbles, and it paid off on Tuesday. She says a tip led her to the man at a McDonald's in South L.A. Before he got picked up, we confronted him and asked him, where's the dog? He denied it at first, but once I showed him the videotape from the, the groomer, he's like, oh, okay, okay, I gave your dog, I gave it to a Filipino lady on Wish and Western. And then after that, a little while later, he's like, I know I gave it to a homeless person. LAPD confirmed the man is in their custody at the 77th jail, but Pebbles wasn't with him. And now Taylor is asking for the public's help to find her best friend of 11 years. I feel good that he was arrested, but, but I feel even better if I get my dog back. Now back out here live, as you can see, the groomer has posted that same poster showing the dog and the suspect right there. And speaking with her today, it was very obvious she does feel bad. And she also turned over uh, that surveillance video to the owner. Now, as for Taylor, uh, she's telling me, look, she just wants her dog back. She knows somebody out there possibly has it. She says as long as somebody turns it into police or her, or her or the phone number on that poster, she will not even consider pressing any charges. She just wants her best friend back. We're live in Koreatown tonight, Bill Malugin. Fox 11 News. So Bill Malugin there from our sister station and with that report, pretty interesting story and scary stuff that that stuff can actually happen. Um, switching gears, just to remind you that it is still super cold out. Here's a live look at the Ocean City Boardwalk in Maryland. We were tracking that bomb cyclone storm yesterday. It's still frigidly cold here in DC and then of course on the coastline. That's what it looks like there. You can see a little movement with the waves and the ocean in the far, far right corner. Um, so it's still, and there's the video buffering a little bit, but it's still freezing there, the snow covering the beach um, there in Ocean City. So live look there, just so um, you can take a peep at what it's like on the coastline there. We're going to go back to the services in Highlands Ranch, Colorado for the slain officer. You challenged me, encouraged me, held me accountable, and pushed me to be a better human being every day. Watching you hold our newborn baby girls and weep over them will forever be etched in my heart. I never thought I'd feel more pride than when I saw you as a daddy. Babe, you are an amazing father and loved your girls so well. I promise to raise our girls with the Lord as my focus. I promise to raise them in a home that bleeds blue. I promise to teach them to kick a soccer ball, have a love for music, and the outdoors. I promise that I will not teach them to drive when they turn 16 and instead get your brothers in blue to do the job. <laughs> I promise to tell them every day that their daddy loved them to the moon. You, my love, are my hero. I am honored that you chose me to be your bride eight and a half years ago. And knowing what I know now, I'd do it again in a heartbeat.
You are my rock, my heart, and my soulmate, and I am so proud of you. I will honor you and celebrate you with every fiber of my being for the rest of my life. So save a seat in heaven for me and meet me at the gates when the Lord calls me home. I can't wait to be held by you again. Oh, my love, forever and always. Good morning. I'll come at this from a different perspective from Gracie. He was my son. He actually was my buddy, and I was a daddy. What I want to tell you this morning, I want to say thank you. Our family, we are heartbroken, and we're grieving, and we're hurting. but we cannot do it without you. Family and friends are in front of me. I know you've come from many, many places. And I thank you. Men and women of blue, our motto is gonna be, go blue, live like Zach. I thank you to Castle Rock family. And I thank you to the Douglas County family. I've never seen the love that I've seen with the love of blue, and I may wear blue for the rest of my career in banking, and they always have to get over it, but my wife would tell you most of my things in the, in the claws are already blue, so I guess I'm prepared to do that. People ask us, how are you doing this? How am you doing this? It is because we're clinging to our faith, the light, of Jesus Christ and our hope is in him I want to read I'm going to read a verse and then I'm going to read a life verse because Zach also had a life verse people ask me sometimes what's that mean it means something that God lays on your heart and it's something that's etched there you'll hear about Zach's later but I'm going to share mine with you right now it's Psalms 4610 be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted above the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. And Zach's life verse was Joshua, Joshua 1.9. As I was preparing for this, um, I was awoken in the middle of the night, and Gracie knows this. I couldn't sleep. And that night, I felt like Zach was present. He's, Dad, it is going to be okay. Please sleep. Please rest and know that I'm okay. So I found this scripture, and uh, one of my son-in-laws said, Dad, you know you're really good if you just wait for the last minute. It's got to be God-ordained, and I think I was working on this right before we got in the Mordecade. So it's 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It's the second letter that Paul is writing to the Corinthians at the church. Paul had really made them want to affirm in their faith and know who Jesus was. But this spoke to my heart and spoke to our family's heart. And he said to me, this is 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. So with that, I thought I would try to tell a few stories about Zach. And I think if you know us and know him and know Gracie, he can make everyone laugh. So it's not out of respect that we may laugh. It's out of loving him because he's probably looking at me like, what in the world are you doing? And as Gracie and I were trying to pray last night, and I was praying with her, and I thought she hung up on me. The phone dropped, and I'm like, Gracie, are you there? I didn't know what happened. She says, no, I think Zach was just kind of messing with us because we were trying to have a, a quiet moment. So a little bit about Zach. Uh, he was born in Nashville, Tennessee. 
Um, we moved a lot, and I think that helped him be prepared to uh, see all types of people. Um, and uh, he was born Zachary Spurlock Parrish III, named after me. I was favorably known as ZP2 and ZP3. And um, he, uh, he, was, he was my three and my two, and I know he, had a, he, has, a, he has a two here that used, they used to call me one and two and uh, Castle Rock. But um, he was born, born there, and we moved to Atlanta, Georgia, Roanoke, Virginia, Vienna, Virginia, Charlotte, North Carolina, Houston, and he moved here in Colorado in 2009. You know, he enjoyed life. He never met a stranger. Uh, he loved on people and made friends wherever he went. Our first name, Zachary, is God Remembered. That's what it stands for. As I reflect on his life, a few stories came to mind. I was thinking about uh, all of his energy that he had when he was little. He was about Caroline's age, about four, and he loved water sprinklers. He loved to run through water sprinklers, and I think he did it for about two hours. And even uh, as much as he did it, he was, Dad, I gotta keep going, I gotta keep going. And that's who, uh, the zest of life that he had. And I think about birthday parties, and Chris reminded me of a birthday party. She remember when he turned six and we were at Chuck E. Cheese? And I gotta tell you, that was a big deal for him, because at four, he was deathly afraid of Chuck E. Cheese. He would scream bloody murder, that big mouse came to him. So if you think he's all brave and mighty and big, he was scared of a stuffed mouse. So, uh, but he, he went to each one of those boys and thanked them for their gift, one by one, and I'd forgotten about it, and Chris said, he's always had that heart of thankfulness for friendship. And then I think about baseball. Um, with that, uh, he and I, was, we were connected with baseball. I can't tell you how many trips we made, how many travel trips we made, but one came to mind, so I think most of you that have served uh, next to him and family knows when something was put on his mind, you couldn't stop him. We were at Vero Beach at the uh, uh, Dodgers spring training, and there was one of those booths, you know, where you, like, you know what your pitch is, you can win. Well, Zach had a fastball at a 10 years old that was 52 miles an hour consistently. He knew it. So eight helmets in that he'd already won. The guy comes up to me and said, how many does he want? I said, I don't know, let me ask him. So I asked him, he said, Dad, I've got 10 buddies at home and I'm winning 10 helmets. So with 10, the guy left, it was only a dollar each, so I gave him another 20 because I felt really bad. And then he had to buy another suitcase to get all the helmets on. Uh, but I, I have that fond memory that he enjoyed life. He enjoyed life. And the reason why he enjoyed life, he's had Jesus living, living in his heart. That bat that you see on stage is one that when we were here the last time, I said, why in the world are you keeping that bat? Do you remember me, Gracie, asking him that? So that bat that's on stage represents a time that a team that he was on in North Carolina, we went to Cooperstown and they won the championship. And he had to have an engraved bat. And at the time I thought, good grief, I can't believe I'm buying something that will probably, will never, used or see again and just helps me to know that the bat's here and um, he loved baseball. He loved his family and we loved him. I got to hold him when he was born. I got to hold him many times and cry with him and Somebody asked me about that scar on his right eyebrow that's so prominent today in the picture. Uh, that happened at 14 months old, on Mother's Day. He decides that he can fall down some marble st stairs and be okay, and he was fine. And we got to the hospital. We had to tie him down with a papoose patch to keep him on the bed. He was trying to get out, so uh, that's what that is. But one of my favorite things about him and about life most of the people from Houston know that he um, had a lot of girls that he liked. <laughs> and, um, but I will tell you something that happened. I love the story because Gracie kind of told him, eh. and I think he you got your number by listening to you giving a number to another guy. 
And uh, he uh, did that, and uh, he calls me. And Grace, I don't know if you know what he told me, but he said, Dad, I've met the most beautiful girl that I've ever seen, and I think she's the one. And I said, wait a minute, you've only had two dates with her. He goes, I'm telling you, she's the one. And so we knew she was the one because uh, our family started by Claire, used antibacterial, and Zach would not get it on his hands. And he goes, well, I started using antibacterial because Gracie told me I didn't need to use it. So we knew she was going to be family. And um, the most beautiful thing that happened with this marriage is that we have a second family. I told Tim and Michelle and Lauren and Bobby that I would not have shared his life with any other family. The minute we met you. And so I thank you for loving on him and accepting him as family. He loved music. Um, those of you from Houston know he played on high school, and at some point he decided he wasn't going to play baseball. And that guitar represents a time that he made a transition in his life. And last night, some people that were here knew that I was looking for the treasures that I hoped were still in that guitar box. Uh, he wrote music. He wrote music. Beautiful music. He sung to Gracie. He said that's what really clinched her was the music, but we don't know. Maybe it was the black Mustang that he drove. We won't know. But he, lo he loved music, and I, I was weeping because I remember him singing those songs, and he loved music. Michelle was telling me it was too quiet. He had to have music on. So um, that song was special to Gracie, and all the songs you hear were. But I want to tell you he loved his role as a policeman. Quickly check, checking in with you guys from the newsroom. This is a live uh, look at the funeral service, um, which ultimately started a little bit after we saw that sort of long procession in Highlands Ranch, Colorado. This is the father, actually, of the slain officer, Zachary Parrish, um, who left his wife and two young daughters behind after he was killed on an ambush during a domestic uh, violence call, actually, on New Year's Eve. So really, really sad circumstances. but. Um, we've been talking about this for a little bit, also weather. I see some of you guys mentioning the cold weather. We'll show you some interesting shots from the sky of the winter storms that's hitting the East Coast. Um, a lot of cool pictures coming out of that, as we saw in um, our area, too, in Maryland, Ocean City, and the coast. Um, but I want to quickly show you this clip of the officer's wife and his two daughters from earlier. We didn't actually catch this live, but we clipped this out. Um, and it's this really, really poignant moment where her daughters um, basically comfort her, and she's up there with, with I think, her father um, and her daughters talking about her husband. So we'll jump away from this live feed and show you this clip um, now. And he will be glorified, and I will do everything in my power, Zach Parrish, to honor you. And I will raise these girls to love you. It means so much to hear your stories and to hear about Zach, because that's what I'm clinging on to right now. So I want to hear about him, and I want to soak it in. So please share if you feel it. Because it means so much to us. And just your presence here means the world. So thank you for coming. Thank you so much. So that was his wife um, earlier on in the ceremony. We'll take it back to the live ceremony um, now so you can check in there with his father who's still speaking um, about his life. Um, and uh, again, sorry to bring you some of the depressing live news today, but it is a big talker from the New Year's, uh, New Year's Eve when he was killed. And like you guys have been mentioning, we've seen, unfortunately, a lot of these circumstances where police are killed in action um, and then honored some of them here locally, too. This one, um, he happened to have actually lived some of his life nearby in the area in Vienna, Virginia, and some other local uh, lo uh, areas kind of around the DMV, but ultimately settled in Colorado. and. Um, it was there that he uh, died in this shooting 
this past New Year's Eve, so not even a week ago. So we'll go back into that ceremony. Men in blue, it's okay to hold hands with other men in blue. <laughs> Father, this is the hardest thing I have ever had to do. Lord, I am praying that through this, your Holy Spirit will rain down on this family to give us peace and comfort that we will not be able to understand. And I pray for the men and women in blue and all that serve in this congregation that are sitting here hearing me, Lord, that you will put a hedge of protection upon them. But I pray them, they too, live in a dark place. I pray that your light will be part of them as they leave here today, Lord. I thank you for Gracie. I thank you for Caroline. And I thank you for Abby. And I pray a special prayer for them right now. Surround them, Lord. Love them. Give Gracie the strength and the power to continue. We will miss Zach. And we give you praise that he's with you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Troy Kessler, and I was Zach's best friend. A number of years ago, I started praying to God for a strong male friendship. I had friends and acquaintances, but no one close enough to really walk through life with in a way where we could shoot the breeze and have fun, but also where we could talk about anything and be there for each other through life's difficult times. I prayed for months, and before I even started praying, God had the exact person in mind. In uh, 2012, I joined a small group uh, at the church, uh, and this is where I first met Zach and Gracie. Zach and I hit it off right away and uh, started talking, and we decided to work out together before work. This was before either of us was in law enforcement where we were both working in areas of finance. Um, among the many conversations we had at the gym, even before the sun would rise, we talked about everything or anything and everything, including our future career goals. And I mentioned that I'd been interested in getting into law enforcement. At that time, Zach wanted to promote up into the business banking world and had thoughts of going back to school to get his MBA. <clears throat> Zach told me at one point that he'd always had a desire to be in law enforcement, but did not seem to think it was possible. The subject of law enforcement kept coming up in our workouts, and one day he called me after an interview for a business banking position. He told me the interview went great, and they offered him the job right away, but when they started telling him the details of the job specifically, I remember him mentioning the ridiculous amounts of cold calling he had to do he immediately realized this was not what he wanted for his life. He turned down the job. In our phone conversation, he said, Troy, I'm not doing this anymore. It's not what God wants and it's not what I want. If I make a decision to change careers, I need to do it now. He asked me to pray for the difficult change uh, that it would bring to his family and the many obstacles ahead. Zach did not waste time at all. He never wasted time when he knew what he wanted. He talked with Gracie and received her support. He applied and was accepted into Arapahoe Community College uh, post program. And for months, Zach worked full time and attended long night classes. 
and weekend classes and excelled as he achieved his post-certification. At the same time, I'd been accepted into the Colorado State Patrol and was going through the academy. It was really awesome to be able to start our law enforcement careers at the same time, knowing that we both felt led into them by God. You've all heard about what an awesome officer Zach was, um, but I want to tell you the kind of friend he was to me. When working out regularly together, um, or when working out regularly together, became difficult due, hard, due to our different schedules. We still made time on a regular basis to hang out. I can hear Zach calling me now, telling me that he misses my face, how he needed to see me soon. People would tease me about my bromance with Zach, and he and my wife Jen would tease each other about who was really number one. He constantly talked about Gracie and his girls, how much he loved them, and at times how he struggled to love them how they deserved. We talked about our personal walks with the Lord, and many times we both struggled to spend time with Him regularly and lead our families the way we should. We encouraged each other in everything. I can, I can still and will never forget Him validating where I was at, but then saying, I encourage you to, and fill in the blank there. Zach was intentional about making sure he wasn't in the spotlight and always took the opportunity to ask me about my life. I know he had the same intentionality with many of you as well. Zach and I had a common love for people and wanted others to know this love came from Jesus. It did not matter what we did as long as we did it together. When we got distracted by things of this world, we relied on one another to reel each other back in. Zach would tell me that when he had a short fuse or was wired or quick to anger after a long week at work, Gracie would tell him that he needed some Troy time. <laughs> Zach and Gracie, or Zach said Gracie told him he was much more even kill and chilled out after we hung out. And it was my honor and joy to be there for Zach in this way. For those of you who knew Zach, he could have sold anything. He found something he loved, and it was phenomenal. And he wanted to share, he wanted you to share in it too. A good pre-workout or a protein, phenomenal. A chicken quesadilla with Chick-fil-A sauce, phenomenal. A Nissan Titan 4X Pro, phenomenal. Then when he got his F-150 just a few months later, phenomenal. As you heard about Zach, he loved the adrenaline rush and the thrill in life. Just last year, after years of trying to persuade me into skydiving with him, I finally gave in. Jumping from a perfectly good airplane at 18,000 feet with my best friend, phenomenal. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, and in case you didn't know, all those phenomenal things, as Zach said, would change your life. He always wanted me to come to Castle Rock PD, and uh, shortly after Douglas County, I wanted him to come to state. It would have been a blast. Zach had been trying to persuade me for years to buy a house next door to him. In their most recent home, there's a house across the street for sale, and he told me to buy the house on numerous occasions. Um, we daydreamed about building a tunnel from one house to the other, <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> being able to see each other more often. <laughs> Zach was a man I always admired and looked up to. Zach loved the Lord. He was a man that loved his wife and his daughters with his whole heart. They were the loves of his life and they were his priorities. He had such a self-awareness and seemed to have an answer for everything. And when he didn't, he found it. All right, guys, we're going to switch it up and bring you over to some video of tape playback just from moments ago of President Trump at the White House. Let's catch what he had to say. Nobody really had in mind, so we're very honored by it. But the market is good. 
the jobs reports were very good and we think they're going to get really good over the next couple of months. So again, we're going to Camp David with a lot of the great Republican senators and we're making America great again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir, should Steve Bannon be fired? Should Steve Bannon be fired, sir? Well, sometimes President Trump gives a little comment to the press when they question him towards the end of those. I thought that would be a little bit longer and more informative, but um, unfortunately not today. Hopefully we'll have more of that stuff for you guys coming up on Monday. So with that, guys, we're going to tell you uh, to have a great weekend and come see us again on Monday at 11 o'clock. We'll, we'll be breaking down the weather and then news and all sorts of different segments um, for breaking news uh, stories. Hopefully we have a lot of great stuff for you next week. So join in with us. Again, next week, we're going to leave you with this awesome shot from NOAA. They released a video of uh, outer space from outer space that shows sort of the path and the look of the bomb cyclone that is hitting the East Coast. So check this out, guys, and enjoy, and we'll see you next week.